The next item of business is a debate on motion 9648 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on the Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill at Stage 3. Before the debate begins, the presiding officer is required understanding orders to decide whether or not, in his view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter. Put briefly, that is whether it modifies the electoral system and franchises for Scottish parliamentary elections. If it does, the motion to pass the bill will require support from a supermajority of members, that is two-thirds majority of all members, which is 86. In the case of this bill, the presiding officer has decided that, in his view, no provision of the Wild Animals and Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. Can I now invite all members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, and I call on Rosanna Cunningham, Cabinet Secretary, to speak and move the motion. Thank you. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to open this brief debate. Uh, and I would like to thank, uh, at the outset, all those stakeholders who provided evidence and the committee members involved for their detailed and constructive consideration of the issues raised. Um, firstly, I'd like to deal with a very formal matter, presiding officer. Uh, I would like to advise Parliament, for the purposes of Rule 9.11 of the Standing Orders, that Her Majesty, having been informed of the purport of the Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill has consented to place her prerogative and interests so far as they are affected by the Bill at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. This Bill, it turned out, required Crown consent. The principle of a ban on wild animals in travelling circuses has had cross-party support for many years, although such circuses rarely visit Scotland now. This bill is therefore a preventative measure based on ethical concerns about the use of animals in travelling circuses in general. It makes a clear statement to the world that the Scottish people respect the innate character of wild animals and will not tolerate their subjection to a nomadic lifestyle as a spectacle for entertainment. The Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee raised some concerns about the wording of the bill in their Stage 1 report. I responded by explaining the reasoning behind the wording and supporting some changes to the bill at stage two, when the definitions of wild animals and traveling circuses in particular were debated vigorously and on occasion humorously as well. Suitable amendments were, however, agreed to avoid requiring a list of types of animal or characteristics of a circus on the face of the bill. Presiding officer, I don't have much time, so I want to deal with one substantive issue which has arisen uh, uh, more recently and subsequent to my appearances at committee. I believe the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee regarded as unusual the new powers to specify whether a kind of animal is or is not wild and whether a kind of undertaking is or is not a travelling circus. The scenarios covered by the powers are themselves unusual. Guidance on the meaning of wild animal and travelling circus and how these phrases should be applied in practice will, of course, be provided. However, the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee felt that that guidance alone was insufficient given the crucial role of the definitions in the bill. There's a huge variety of forms of entertainment using wild animals and obviously of kinds of wild animals themselves. Although the bill's definitions will be sufficient in the vast majority of cases, the additional powers provide a mechanism to provide clarity in marginal cases where there is uncertainty, confusion, or disagreement about whether or not particular kinds of animals or undertakings fall within the definitions. The powers in the bill to specify a kind of animal as wild or not, and an undertaking as a traveling circus or not, are for the purposes of the bill. It is expected that a court would, in the case of that animal or undertaking, apply the act on the basis that the specified animal is a wild animal and the specified undertaking is a travelling circus. The regulations specifying what is a wild animal or a travelling circus are, however, expressly without prejudice to the general definitions in sections two and three. It is possible that after regulations come into force, difficult issues could arise in a specific case because, for example, circumstances relating to that status of the animal have changed. And we often refer to the uh, llamas and alpacas as being a, an animal where that has happened in our lifetime. We therefore accept that a court would have to construe the Act on the basis that sections 2 
and three, have determinative effect and regardless of what previously had been specified by regulations. In that sense, we accept that the regulations would have been indicative only. These powers, and specifically the way in which they were drafted to protect the generality of the definitions in the bill, were supported by committee members at stage two. They would be used only after looking at the evidence case by case and through the affirmative procedure after consideration by parliamentary committee. I believe that these powers, backed up by the clear guidance that we will be issuing, will ensure that we have a robust bill that is practical and easy to enforce. And presiding officer, once again, I want to say thank you to all of those who ha have been involved in the process of this bill, those who tested the notion of list one way or the other in terms of wild or domesticated animals and who came to the same conclusion that we had that it was extremely difficult to do that. And in conclusion, I move. <laughs> Can I? Well, it has to be very, very brief. The Cabinet Secretary is actually over our time. Just a wee minute, Mr Scott. Very brief. Very, very brief. Thank you. Will the guidance be issued to me, uh, yes, It will. I, in conclusion, uh, uh, Presiding Officer, I move that the Parliament agrees that the Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill be agreed. Thank you. Uh, I now call Donald Cameron. Mr Cameron, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Here we are again, ringside at stage three of this bill. Um, in sincerity, I'm delighted that as we reach the end of what has been an eventful year in politics, we are here today to discuss legislation that will protect many wild animals uh, and prohibit their use in Scotland within the realm of a travelling circus. And with the likely passage of this bill to Royal Assent, we are catching up with the 18 other European countries that presently have restrictions on the use of wild animals in circuses. And it appears there is now to be UK government legislation on the matter forthcoming too. Uh, I think we've all agreed that on both animal welfare and ethical grounds, it is correct that we now ban the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. Whilst there is no evidence that there have been such circuses um, operating recently in Scotland, I think everyone acknowledges that it remains imperative that we pass legislation to ban it. This was a bill in which the Eclair Committee has played an important role. And whilst it cannot be said that this is a landmark bill, it is a bill which highlights the necessity of our committee system and the rigour and scrutiny that it provides. When this bill was first discussed at, it, at stage one, we collectively raised a variety of concerns around legal definitions, which were primarily concerns of the many and varied industries that potentially could have been uh, affected. At the time, we raised the fact that the bill raised criminalising shows and events which have high standards of animal welfare, such as llama displays at the Royal Highland Show or organisations in my own region of the Highlands and Islands, such as the Cairngorm Reindeer Centre. Um, we raised the fact that there was a problem around the definition of circus and travelling circus and a lack of clarity as to what constituted a wild animal. All in all, this uh, presented many legal issues with the bill as it stood. However, it is testimony to, testimony to the Eclair Committee, which was able to listen to the evidence and work with the Scottish Government to implement uh, needed changes. And I'd like to thank my colleagues, John Scott, uh, Mark Ruskell, David Stewart, and the convener, Graham Day, whom I hope won't be uh, won't mind being described as veterans uh, of the system uh, and help guide us novices through the intricacies of stage two and the amendments which were lodged either to improve the definitions or to provide assurances of one kind or another. And while several amendments were not moved in their original form, it is clear that these prompted a response from the Scottish Government. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for the clarity that she has provided both today uh, and on past occasions. Um, I should also comment on the input of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, who raised several uh, points last week around similar issues, and again thank the Cabinet Secretary for clarifying those issues today on the record uh, in relation to, to definitions and accompanying guidance. These aren't just matters of arcane legal interest to lawyers like uh, herself and, and me, but they're very important and I'm glad that they uh, have been taken on board. Um, so it is, it is abundantly clear, Deputy Presiding Officer, that the Eclair Committee has played an important role in ensuring that this bill is fit for purpose and addresses many of the concerns that operators had with the initial wording of the bill. Uh, as a result, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservatives are satisfied that this bill will deliver what it sets out to achieve and we will be voting for it at stage three today. It will ensure that shows and exhibitions that adhere to high standards which are presently set out will be able to continue operating whilst ensuring that the exploitation of wild animals in the arena of travelling circuses is now at an end. 
because Deputy Presiding Officer, as a result of the passage of this historic bill onto the statute book, we will in Scotland finally and at last truly be able to say that Nellie the Elephant has packed her trunk and said goodbye to the circus. I know there's just more of that to come. David Stewart, please. <laughs> Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, Labour will support the Wild Animals and Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill at decision time. And as uh, a member of the Clear Committee and a strong supporter of a number of animal welfare organisations, such as One Kind, uh, I moved a number of amendments which I felt would have improved the bill. And I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary and the Committee for supporting my amendment on the offence ground. Uh, at one level, of course, you could argue we're attempting to restrict something that doesn't happen, as we've no travelling circuses in Scotland. However, the bill once passed will future-proof this position by introducing the bill on ethical rather than welfare grounds. And as the uh, Spice paper makes clear, uh, circus is Latin for circle or ring. And one of the first major entertainment complexes in, in, in ancient Rome was Circus Maximus, which held up to 300,000 uh, spectators. But moving to more modern times, in 2014, the Scottish Government public consultation received over 2,000 responses, with a strong majority in favour of the ban at 98%, while 96% were opposed to the performance or exhibition of wild animals. The bill, as we've heard, proposes to prohibit the performance, display or exhibition of wild animals in travelling circuses, and the policy memorandum lists the Scottish Government's view of the ethical challenges, which are basically the impact and respect for animals, the impact on the travelling environments, and the ethical costs and benefit. Uh, on a technical point, the bill does not seek to be, uh, prohibit circuses from travelling with wild animals, but to create a criminal offence of travelling with or transporting for the purpose of performance, display or exhibition. It's on a summary conviction uh, of level five, which is currently £5,000. And enforcement, of course, will be by local authorities, but the uh, philosophical underpinning will be based on the five freedoms set out by the Farm Animal Welfare Council Statement of 1979 which is basically freedom of environment, diets, normal behaviour, to be housed with or apart from other animals, or protected from suffering, injury or disease. And as I said during the stage one debate, President Officer, animal welfare organisations such as One Kind believe there are strong animal welfare justifications for a ban on the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. Uh, in their excellent um, petition to the Petitions Committee, they said, and I quote, a travelling circus combines a number of specific characteristics including extreme confinement, frequent transport and relocation, and training for performance, which creates an environment where the needs of wild animals cannot be met. This combination is not found elsewhere, even in zoos, where wild animals are kept captive. It increases the risk of stress, and in some cases ill treatment of the animals, and makes effective inspection and regulation uh, very difficult. And investigations into the UK circuses in recent years have documented shocking examples of se severe habitual abuse of animals. For example, in 1999, individuals from uh, Tripperfield Circus were found guilty of cruelty to a ch chimpanzee and an elephant. And on 2009, the Great British Circus, the beating of elephants prior to performance was filmed by Animal Defenders International. And earlier this year, a further expose by Animal Defenders uh, showed an arthritic uh, elephant named Anne being repeatedly beaten and abused by members of staff uh, in the Robert, uh, Bobby Roberts uh, circus. Um, but in conclusion, presiding officer, uh, I've, as one kind of argued, it's crucial that in the future there are no gaps in legislation uh, covering performance, display or exhibition of animals in Scotland. The Scottish Government has announced its intention to develop new licence requirements to, to protect the welfare of wild and domestic animals not covered by the current legislation. I'm pleased to support the bill and endorse it to Parliament. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I now into the open debate, uh, speeches of four minutes uh, with a little time in hand. I call Graham Day to be followed by Finlay Carson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the road to this point, we're in a couple of hours or less than that now, we will hopefully pass this bill, has been a long one to say the least. It was 13 years ago that the then Scottish Executive consulted on the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Bill and in the process identified significant concerns regarding the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. And it will be three years next month since this Scottish Government launched its consultation on introducing a ban 
We are here now and right to be so. As children, many of us will have attended travelling circuses and marvelled at the lions and tigers and elephants, but times change and so does society's view on what is and isn't ethically or morally justifiable. The scrutiny process undertaken by the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee highlighted a number of issues and I want to reflect upon some of those. Criticisms made around justification of the bill included the assertion that it was harmful to young people to see animals being used in such a way. It was pointed out that the opinion of children and young people hadn't actually been sought. Helpfully, however, in parallel with the committee's consideration, the Scottish Parliament's Education Service used the bill as a live example of the passage of legislation and asked school groups visiting Holyrood their views on whether wild animals and travelling circuses should be banned. Of over 1,000 votes cast by 9 to 13 year olds, 81% were in favour of introducing a ban. And I would contend that as we head into the year of young people, we might, as a parliament, do well to consider how we ought to more formally build on that sort of engagement. Young people have opinions, presiding officer, very often considered, valid and well-formed opinions. And we as MSPs ought to take those on board as we consider legislative change. And I'm pleased that the bill we have before us is one that is widely supported by that next generation. Definitions was, as we have heard, perhaps the main concern for the committee, definitions which made clear what is and isn't a circus, and therefore when travelling would or would not be captured by the bill, and what is and isn't a wild or indeed domesticated animal. In the absence of such definitions being offered by the government in response to the Stage 1 report, a number of members brought forward amendments at Stage 2. The amendments proposed by David Stewart, John Scott and Mark Ruskell were entirely constructive and well-intentioned seeking, in line with the committee's Stage 1 report, to secure helpful clarity. Unfortunately, as the Stage 2 process unfolded, it became clear that none of these would achieve their laudable intentions and overcome the challenges involved in seeking to define circuses, wild animals and those domesticated in nature. Presiding officer, the exchanges around these matters were splendidly and humorously captured in a Hollywood, a Hollywood magazine sketch penned by Liam Kirkcaldy. If members haven't read it, I highly recommend getting online and doing so. The discussions around the emissions of raccoon, raccoon dogs rather, woolly lemurs, tamarins, vicunas, night monkeys and squirrel monkeys, and the ambiguity surrounding wallabies in the context of John Scott and Mark Ruskell's amendments were quite amusing at the time, even more so when wrapped up in a superbly written piece. But there is, of course, a serious side to this, and we did, where possible, need to find some mechanism for addressing the legitimate concerns that have been highlighted. So in the context of circus definition, at least, I was appreciative of the support of colleagues and indeed the Cabinet Secretary in backing a stage two amendment I tabled, which affords ministers a power to bring forward regulation either to define an activity that was perhaps contending it was not a travelling circus when it was indeed subject uh, intended to be subject to the bill and similarly define an activity which was never intended to be captured but might become the subject of efforts to contend it was. In moving the amendment, I made the point that if accompanied by clear guidance, it would go some way to addressing the committee's concerns and not create wriggle room either for activities that should be captured by the scope of the bill to escape it or what might be described as acts of entertainment that were never intended to be captured to be caught. I understand the concerns raised by the DPLR committee, but hopefully the Cabinet Secretary uh, in her opening comments has addressed those. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, uh, let me, as others have, acknowledge the contribution made by a raft of individuals and organisations to getting us to the point we are today and welcome the cross-party support it appears the Bill will command at decision time. Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Colin Smith. Mr Carson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In the stage one debate, there were plenty of puns, and mine certainly won't be as slick as Donald Cameron's, but bear with me, uh, mine certainly won't be as er elephant. But perhaps the, the, the Labour group should have been leading this debate today with the bill going through the parliament. The only circus to look forward to will be the next leadership election. And since Kezia's trip to visit the wild animals in the jungle, she certainly has the qualifications. <laughs> However, as I've said previously, the, the light-hearted manner in, in which the members across this chamber have approached this in previous debates in no way reflects the serious manner in which we've dealt with this bill, or indeed the importance with which this committee and my colleagues take the subject relating to animal welfare. The Scottish Conservatives supported the general principles of this bill at stage one, and put forward amendments at stage two, reflecting the commitment that we have to ensure that we have good laws to secure the highest standards of animal welfare. 
We are supportive of a ban on the use of wild animals in travelling circuses on ethical and welfare grounds by delivering robust legislation. Across this chamber, we've heard a number of concerns over the drafting of the bill, concerns which we now believe the Cabinet Secretary has taken on board. These concerns were chiefly around definitions of what is a wild animal and what is a travelling circus. Our concerns have always been founded on the desire to see the most effective legislation without wriggle room for those who would seek to either continue to use wild animals in this type of activity or indeed those who would seek to outlaw other types of activity which was never intended to be covered by the bill, including llamas and raptors at country fairs or even sheepdog trials. Vague definitions risk criminalising those who put on a show or events where animals had to be transport transported to the event and this needed clarification. The committee's view was that the bill, as initially drafted, did not fully address the issues it set out to cover and was at risk of capturing animal performances and shows as mentioned, although this may not have been the intention. This amended bill should now not result in another piece of weak legislation from the Scottish Government that will fall down or be ineffective in the courts. The fact that little time was actually spent exploring the use of ethics the ethical argument behind the bill indicates that right across this chamber, whether on welfare or ethical grounds, we believe that public performance of wild animals is no longer acceptable. The debate around this legislation has largely centred on poor drafting and fears that it had the potential to fail in what it set out to achieve. We in these benches believe that significant process has been made and will be supporting the bill this evening. Thank you. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Mr Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to contribute to what I hope will be the next step in ending cruelty and distress inflicted on animals in travelling circuses. As President Officer, your, your Deputy Convener on the, the Cross-Party Group on Animal Welfare, I was delighted that we unanimously agreed the principle of this bill when it was previously debated. And I'm sure that today we will also unanimously make clear that the days of exploiting wild animals for human gratification in Scotland will soon be nothing more than a shameful memory sending a welcome, powerful message about the value we place on animal welfare. The use of wild animals in travelling circuses is fundamentally cruel and a full ban is the only way to put a stop to this mistreatment returning to Scotland in the future. Highly respected animal welfare charities such as One Kind have rightly made the powerful case that there are both strong ethical and animal welfare grounds to ban this practice. The mobile nature of travelling circuses means they invariably fail to effectively recreate a wild animal's natural environment. Animals are often subjected to restrictive conditions and uninteresting surroundings without the space to recreate their natural behaviour, to explore, to socialise and to find food as they would in the wild. This can have a, a wide range of serious physical and psychological implications for the animals. Likewise, the performances and tricks animals are forced to do require intensive training and can inflict significant amounts of pain and distress on those animals. There is widespread use of negative reinforcement and in some instances abusive training techniques. Even in instances of best practice, the very act of forcing wild animals to perform on command alters their natural behaviour and suppresses their natural instincts. This is directly in opposition to their welfare and is fundamentally unethical. There is a great deal of research into the impact of travelling circuses on the welfare and well-being of wild animals which support this view. The conclusion of research undertaken by the Welsh Government was that captive animals, and I quote, in circuses and other travelling animal shows do not achieve their optimal animal welfare requirements and the evidence would therefore support a ban. These are not problems that can be fixed through increased regulation or strengthened guidelines. They are inherent to travelling circuses and must be addressed with a full ban. We now have considerably more insight into the intelligence and sentience of wild animals than we did in the past, yet the appalling use of wild animals for entertainment continues. By reducing wild animals to a source of entertainment at the expense of their well-being, travelling circuses contribute to a culture that undervalues the welfare and the rights of those animals. The initial bill was by no means perfect, and I'd like to thank the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee who have tried to tackle those imperfections and shortcomings through their commendable work on the bill, preempting many of the potential problems the bill may face. It's vital that the laws we pass are legally watertight 
and easily enforceable, and the changes made in line with the committee's recommendation have very much improved the bill significantly. The inclusion of more clearly defined terms and the establishment of ministerial powers to clarify these definitions protects against willful misinterpretation and potential loopholes, albeit it could be argued that more could have been done to incorporate that message within the bill itself. Likewise, I'm pleased that David Stewart's amendment clarifying what constitutes an offence was also agreed. However, I am disappointed that the Scottish Government have failed to respond to other points raised by the committee and by members during the Stage 1 debate. In particular, serious concerns were raised by Council officials and the SSPCA about the practicalities of enforcement. The discretionary nature of local authorities' enforcement duty combined with continued cuts to their budgets poses serious questions about the Bill's enforceability. Enforcement on the ground must be closely monitored and the possibility of an inspector appointed by ministers must be revisited should there be any evidence of problems in this regard. There is also a need to ensure there are no gaps in legislation covering performance, display or exhibition of animals in Scotland and I look forward to the Scottish Government coming forward with new licensing requirements to further protect the welfare of all animals used for public performances not covered by this bill. That being said, President Officer, I believe this bill is a positive step forward, finally consigning this archaic, outdated cruelty to the history books where it belongs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Mark Ruskell, followed by Liam McCarter. Mr Ruskell. Thank please. you, Presiding Officer. And can I declare an interest as a member of the British Veterinary Association? And can I welcome the Stage 3 debate today, um, which does mark a watershed moment. For years, we've seen incremental improvements in welfare legislation, protecting key freedoms and placing responsibilities onto animal keepers. But I believe this is the first time that ethical reasons have been used alongside the welfare evidence to bring about a change, and that's very welcome. The bill fundamentally recognises that meeting basic welfare needs is not enough, and that for a wild animal to be unable to display its natural behaviours for its entire life is unethical and unacceptable. Any educational benefits of seeing wild animals in a travelling circus or conservation benefits are non-existent. There may have been educational benefits in an age before internet or TV, but we live in a very different world now, where the power and grace of a hunting tiger or the social intelligence of an elephant is displayed on primetime TV or even on the digital whiteboard of a school classroom. So it's an important precedent that's being set today for anyone concerned about the rights of animals. And it begs the question about where do we go next? And I welcome the government's commitment to review further the regulations of all performance animals. I still believe it would have been better to have conducted that full review in advance of this bill being brought forward, as the Welsh Government did, with clear conclusions as to which animal performances to either ban, regulate further, or leave alone. The use of wild animals in travelling circuses is the starkest example of a practice that needs to be banned, but we shouldn't have closed minds to reforming how both domestic and wild animals are used in other performances, particularly in static circuses. So although some members may poke fun at Christmas reindeer or birds of prey displays at garden centres being further regulated, I would say look at the evidence with an open mind. And if there are welfare issues to be answered, then why would we not wish to regulate further? Now, turning to the bill at stage two, there are clearly concerns about which animals should be included in the ban and the definition of a circus. And the Cabinet Secretary pointed out omissions in both John Scott's amendment and my own, which to me only suggested that there probably is a list of animals that the government considers is captured by the ban. It just doesn't want to put it on the face of the bill. However, the committee's central argument that there needs to be greater definition has been acknowledged. And I welcome that draft guidance has now been produced by the government with a commitment that this is finalised and introduced at the same time as the Act is implemented. Officials, I believe, have written out to stakeholders stating that the guidance cannot give a definitive interpretation of the law and that questions of interpretation are ultimately determined by the courts. I hope we don't get to the point of a court test and that the eventual guidance does prove adequate. Presiding officer, this bill is a further step today in our journey towards a society that respects and values animals. There are many more steps to take. Uh, but I look forward to approving the wild animals in Travelling Circuses Bill at decision time tonight. Thank you.
I call Liam MacArthur to follow by Angus Macdonald. Mr MacArthur, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, I, like Mark Ruskell, uh, must declare that I am an honorary member of the, the BBA. Um, I, unlike, I think, most other speakers, though, I don't have the benefit of having uh, sat through the committee's deliberations, but I therefore all, am all the more grateful uh, to the uh, Eclair Committee for their efforts, along with all those who submitted uh, evidence uh, to, uh, to to this important piece of legislation that Scottish Liberal Democrats uh, strongly support and look forward to uh, voting for uh, later on this afternoon. At stage one, uh, the concerns I outlined were uh, those shared, I think, by, by most. Um, I, I concentrated in a couple of areas. One, the, uh, the, the decision to go around an ethical approach as opposed to a welfare uh, approach in this bill. The other, uh, the, uh, the definitional problems that I think many other uh, colleagues have already articulated. I think on the latter, I'm pleased to see that um, a considerable amount of progress appears to be made uh, since uh, that stage one uh, debate. Uh, I think uh, David Stewart has had a hand in that Graham Day as well, uh, but I think uh, I, I would acknowledge um, the movement uh, from, the, from the government and from the Cabinet Secretary in addressing many of those uh, concerns. I note that One Kind and Animal Defenders International uh, believe that a combination of regulating, uh, regulation making powers and draft guidance have successfully addressed uh, a number of the concerns that they identified uh, at stage uh, one. Um, I think in terms of the definition, uh, I note that the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has clarified that the ban is targeted at travelling circuses so that static circuses and any other enterprises that are not considered to be travelling circuses are not caught uh, by the ban and only where those animals are being uh, transported. I know, certainly from correspondence I re received from constituents, um, that there are those that wish to see the legislation extended to cover a far wider range of circumstances, including uh, fixed animal shows involving sea mammals, falconry uh, and others. And I understand why there's a reluctance uh, by the government and indeed the committee to go down this route in the context of this bill. Uh, but I would acknowledge the Scottish Government has uh, since announced its intention uh, to develop new licensing uh, requirements to protect all wild and domestic animal displays or performances that have not uh, already been addressed uh, by this bill uh, or those taking place in licensed zoos. And I very much look forward to considering those proposals in due course. Uh, meantime, I think the regulation uh, making power under affirmative procedure uh, to establish and amend the types of animals covered seems to me a sensible approach. It, it also, as the Cabinet Secretary has made clear, is the approach that is taken uh, to secondary legislation around uh, animal uh, welfare and therefore it seems to be uh, logical and allow the committee an opportunity to scrutinise that in due course. As for the debate around uh, whether or not an ethical as opposed to a welfare approach uh, should be taken, I know the Cabinet Secretary expressed concern uh, about a lack of evidence for a welfare approach and the fear that this could open up the bill uh, to a legal challenge. I'm not entirely sure uh, I know where the committee got to uh, in that debate, but certainly at this stage it didn't seem to be uh, a reason to delay or indeed reject the bill. So in conclusion, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, Scottish Liberal Democrats very much welcome uh, this ban uh, to use wild animals in travelling circuses. Uh, it does, I think, reflect our values as a society and the importance we attach to the highest uh, standards of animal welfare. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr MacArthur. I call Angus Macdonald, last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure I speak for all the members of the committee, that I'm pleased to see this bill uh, finally been put to bed at stage three. Uh, not least because the issues related to the use of wild animals and circuses have been the subject of deliberation by campaigners, policy makers and legislators, legislators for decades. Uh, as we know, part of the existing framework for regulation in this area is covered by the Performing Animals Regulation Act of 1925, and the whole issue was raised again in response to the Scottish Government uh, on the Animal Health and Welfare Bill, which subsequently became uh, an act in 2006. Now, the, the scope of this bill has been purposely focused on wild animals and travelling circuses, with some clear reasons in mind, mainly because the use of wild animals and travelling circuses involves uh, the use of wild animals whose nature is still genetically and behaviourally hardwired, the performance of behaviours or tricks for entertainment that are not natural behaviours, inadequate temporary or mobile accommodation which does not allow animals to act naturally and the fact that there's little or no educational or conservation value. So all of these issues combined present a cumulative ethical challenge to Scottish society giving strong ethical reasons for the ban. So I'm delighted that Scotland's leading the way on improving animal welfare not just with this bill 
but also on uh, plans to develop new licensing requirements to protect the welfare of wild and domesticated animals used for public performances or display in other circumstances not covered by the bill, um, which I understand will be achieved by an SSI under the Animal Health and Welfare Act uh, uh, of 2006, and as such will require consultation and an affirmative resolution. So there's more work to do, although that legislation is intended to apply to all wild and domestic animal displays or performance, except for those already banned under the bill, or those taking place in zoos which are already licensed under zoo legislation. So hopefully there'll be no gaps once this is introduced. Now, there was some concern at the start of the passage of this bill that a more comprehensive approach would be preferable and more effective to, to what some referred to as a piecemeal approach. Uh, we had Andrew Mitchell from the City of Edinburgh Council calling for one piece of legislation. However, it was acknowledged, not least by Nicola O'Brien of the Captive Animals Protection Society, that a comprehensive review of legislation would be a very lengthy process and that taking action now would have more immediate impact. So, President Officer, I'm content that the so-called piecemeal action is delivering the desired outcome much more quickly than would otherwise have been the case. In fact, this bill will enable the ban to be put into effect immediately. Um, and um, just picking up on uh, one of the comments um, from um, Colin Smith, um, I, I think we've got the bill right, uh, but he, he raised the issue with regard to inspections and enforcement. And I have to say, I did have concerns earlier on uh, with regard to that uh, myself, but I'm satisfied uh, that we have got it right uh, at this stage. Um, in closing, President Officer, I was pleased to see the inclusion of children and young people in the consultation process, uh, with the committee not just going through a box-ticking exercise, but making sure their opinions were heard. Uh, one of the key ethical concerns on which the bill is based includes an adverse impact on children and young people that seeing wild animals in travelling circuses may have on the development of respectful and responsible attitudes towards animals in general. An overwhelming majority of respondents to the Scottish Government's consultation 94.7% agreed, which is why the committee identified the importance of engaging with children and young people on this issue, eh, which the convener Graham Day has already alluded to. As a result, 1,045 children and young people were asked through the Scottish Parliament Education Service, eh, and I quote, should it be an offence to use wild animals in travelling circuses, to which 815 responded in favour of a ban. In addition, an online survey with Young Scott last September asked young people aged 11 to 25 the same question with 80% agreeing or strongly agreeing with the proposed ban, and 57% agreed or strongly agreed that seeing wild animals in travelling circuses will make young people respect them less. Uh, so judging by the verdict of the next generation of decision makers, presiding officer, it's clear we've taken the right steps in tackling this important ethical issue in the most timely way possible. And I'm pleased we're leading the way in the UK. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Claudia Beamish to close for Labour. Ms Beamish, please, a generous four minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Scottish Labour welcomes the passing of this bill, which hopefully will be imminent tonight. And as the Cabinet Secretary stated today, wild animals in circuses should not be a spectacle. Uh, today, with travelling circuses, this must surely lead to a similar position, in our view, on static circuses. There was also much discussion in the committee about the protection of wild and, indeed, domestic animals performing in other venues, whether travelling or not. And this must indeed be addressed in future. And Mark Ruskell and others have stressed this point. My colleague David Stewart has highlighted the welfare issues, as have others. Scottish Labour has a robust approach to animal welfare and ethics under his leadership in, in our brief. And this is one of a range of issues that we must go on to tackle. Ensuring that legislation on hunting with dogs is fit for purpose, the banning of shock collars, tail docking, reversing the, um, fighting to reverse the exemptions in our view, consulting to ban on the culling of mountain hares, and tackling exotic animal trade, to name but a few. Emma Harper today has a members debate, um, Adopt, Don't Shop, which is timely before Christmas. And this and many other actions across the chamber show there's cross-party support for many of the animal welfare and ethics issues that we will be addressing in the rest of this parliament. Angus MacDonald and Graham Day spoke today of the next generation's interest and concern about these issues. Definitions in bills always rightly take up committee and Scottish Government time, and this is no exception. Sometimes we revert to common sense approaches, and at others it seems correct to define or indeed to have lists in secondary legislation. With this bill, it's been challenging. 
The committee grappled with definitions throughout the bill process, as did the Scottish Government. Circuses with or without tents, definitions of wild and domestic animals or lists. It is reassuring that the bill was amended at stage two to grant a power on the Scottish ministers, ministers to make regulations to describe a particular type of undertaking act, entertainment or similar thing that is or is not to be regarded as a travelling circus for the purposes of the bill. In terms of the definition of a wild animal, I'm convinced that the power agreed at stage two provides certainty in difficult or borderline cases to ensure that circus operators know what kind of animals may or may not be used in travelling circuses in order to avoid committing an offence. It is also reassuring that these regulations will be subject to the affirmative procedure. Uh, those among us, certainly not myself, but the Cabinet Secretary and uh, Donald Cameron, who are, are lawyers, um, and Donald Cameron made the point that it's not just arcane, these definitions. They do have to be as exact as possible. And uh, the Cabinet Secretary's remarks today in relation to the Delegated Powers Committee's um, deliberations are, in, in our view, reassuring. The committee heard evidence from local authorities about enforcement procedures, as Colin Smith highlighted, and Angus um, MacDonald uh, gave us some reassurance on this. It will be essential that there is absolute clarity in regulation and guidance to ensure that action can be taken. And I do make the point strongly that cuts to budgets could indeed cause um, uh, challenges for uh, local authority um, officers. However, one kind states in its stage three debate briefing, for which we, we thank them, that, and I quote, the Scottish Government has issued clarification on a number of points raised in the stage one report, has created regulation making powers to clarify definitions, and has produced draft guidance that clarifies some of the most significant policy areas. One kind is grateful to the Scottish Government and to members of the Eclair Committee for probing these issues. I think and hope we have got it right. And in the words of my colleague Colin Smith, it is fundamentally cruel, and so therefore we support a ban strongly and we look forward to the passing of the bill and also to future ethical and animal welfare issues which we will debate and act on in this Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. I call on John Scott to close the Conservatives. A generous four minutes. Mr Scott, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I too begin by declaring an interest as an honorary member of the British Veterinary Association and that I believe that they and I welcome the passage of this bill. This is because the BVA and the Scottish Conservatives believe that the needs, particularly the needs of non-domesticated wild animals, cannot be met in the environment of a travelling circus where their ability to express normal behaviour is likely to be completely restricted. So we welcome the passage of this bill at stage three today which builds on the five welfare needs of animals as detailed in the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 and which allows Scotland to be first in developing this legislation in the United Kingdom. Presiding officer, today we welcome the Cabinet Secretary's assurances to develop guidance where required in the bill and our committee is grateful to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for picking up the government's oversights in this regard when bringing forward their stage two amendment on definitions of wild animals. We also acknowledge the hard work of our clerks and the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, as well as the Parliament Bill Team, who have supported us in helping bring forward amendments, as well as the bill itself. We thank the many witnesses who gave evidence to us in committee, as well as those who responded to our call for evidence at stage one, and trust that this bill stops wild animals in travelling circuses ever performing in Scotland again. Presiding officer, I joined the committee this autumn when discussions were still ongoing as to definitions of travelling circuses, wild animals, lists of animals, and David Stewart and Mark Ruskell and Donald Cameron and Graham and Day and I, I think we could perhaps call ourselves uh, survivors of that debate, but uh, we've all referred to that today, uh, and like them, I still had residual concerns over these definitions and the amendments brought forward by government at stage two were a welcome uh, response to the probing amendments lodged by David Stewart, uh, Mark Ruskell and myself at that time. However, I now also acknowledge, as I said a moment ago, that the government has endeavoured to respond to the DPLR's subsequent concerns and the concerns of others that the effect of the powers in new sections 3A1A 
and Section 3A, 2A and Section 3B, 1A and Section 3B, 2A are unusual in principle because they are indicative only and that these regulations are not of themselves apparently sufficient or the appropriate forms of instruments to deliver the interpretations the amendments seek to provide. So, presiding officer, that is why I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's detailed assurances today that guidance, which would be a more appropriate form of instrument, will be brought forward to address the concerns of the DPLR Committee and to further make clear the intentions of the Bill. In addition, this guidance should be put in place forthwith and certainly be available at the time the Bill becomes law after receiving Royal Assent. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's assurance today that this guidance will be brought forward timorously. Presiding Officer, our work is done with regard to the Wild Animals and Travelling Circuses Bill. Again, our grateful thanks to those who have contributed in any way to the passage of this Bill. I now look forward to the Cabinet Secretary's closing remarks and we will be voting for this Bill at decision time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Scott. I call Rosanna Cunningham to close for the Governor. The Cabinet Secretary, you can have um, uh, seven minutes if you want. <laughs> you obviously don't. Well, six minutes. I'll speak very slowly, presiding officer. Um, can I thank all the members who are uh, here today and have taken part in this debate for um, a lively, informed and very interesting debate. I, I think um, it's of intrinsic interest to even those who may simply have wandered into the chamber or are on <laughs> chamber duty, uh, as it is known, um, to listen to some of the concerns and some of the issues um, that they may not have thought uh, were anything to do with uh, um, this particular bill, because this is exactly, and I think a number of members have actually commented on this, precisely the, the kind of thing that happens when a committee begins to unpack what looks like on the surface, a relatively straightforward thing. And the minute you begin to look at it with some care and detail, uh, you do understand that it's not actually as, uh, as straightforward or as simple as perhaps it looked at first thought. So the debate today has been constructive, but the engagement all the way through this process has also been constructive. Uh, and I think it is you know, a joy, sometimes a rare joy, uh, in a parliamentary uh, setup, uh, to have uh, to be able to say that that the process throughout has been constructive, um, and uh, uh, and I think it reflects the concern uh, that people have. It demonstrates the extent to which we all agree the importance and value of the very good intentions behind this bill. I've been struck as I was at stage one by members' passion uh, for this issue. Yet I'm also grateful. Uh, that they have indeed looked beyond a purely emotional response, because that would have been the easy response, um, to fully unpack the practicalities around that proposed prohibition. And I did deal with some of those practicalities in my opening speech. Um, th that th those issues reflect that this is not a fixed situation. Um, I referenced llamas and alpacas in my opening speech, but um, they're not meant to be a joking reference, because there are precise examples uh, of where an animal that would have seemed exotic and wild to our parents' generation um, look like domesticated animals to us now. So they have undergone a change uh, in the way they are viewed, um, treated, and how they live uh, in our country. So I thank the Parliament and all the members of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, and indeed the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee members, for their constructive comments and their invaluable support during the Bill's passage. Furthermore, I'd like to thank all the organisations, the stakeholders, both within the animal welfare sector and in the circus industry itself, the local authorities and the representatives from our screen industry. They've all made constructive contributions and I look forward to including them in continued dialogue as we hopefully move forward to implementing this landmark Bill. I cannot, of course, mention everyone but I should pay particular tribute to one kind for lodging the petition that brought the issue of wild animals and circuses sharply back into focus in 2011, and to COSLA for their continuing help to make the bill and accompanying guidance fit for purpose. John Scott. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for taking the intervention. The three of COSLA and 
Colin Smith uh, raised also the matter of local authorities. And are you optimistic that the amendments um, and the guidance that you will be issuing um, should be sufficient to uh, allow or the local authorities will be less and less likely to have to go to court uh, now as a result of these amendments that you've brought forward at stage two and the guidance you'll be issuing after this. Cabinet Secretary. Continuing engagement with stakeholders, including COSLA, and can I thank John Scott for his ever gallant uh, intervention, which clearly helps to use up some excess time. <laughs> Um, I, I also want to pay particular tribute to the travelling circus industry itself. This has been a difficult issue for them. Those few in the UK still using wild animals are small family-run family operations. The circus is not so much a business, but a way of life for them. They have debated and cooperated throughout the development of this bill with courtesy and openness. I'd like to remind them that travelling circuses without wild animals will always be welcome in Scotland. Our own circus sector is an example of how circus as an art form can develop and remain popular without wild animals. So I want to take just a, a minute or two to go through some of the contributions um, that we heard this afternoon. Um, a couple of members, um, Donald Cameron and Finlay Carson, tried some humour. Um, I, I have to say that I, I, I think Donald Cameron carried this off uh, a little better than Finlay Carson, whose, whose own colleagues looked perplexed and then somewhat bemused at his attempts to interject some humour into the proceedings. Um, but uh, they did try, and, and that has been uh, a mark of the, the way the, the engagement in this bill has proceeded throughout, uh, throughout the bill. Um, Donald Cameron quite rightly flagged up the role of the committee here as well. But uh, if you think these jokes here were funny, then you really do need to go and look at the proceedings of the uh, committee on this and then uh, read the Holyrood article, which was uh, mentioned by Graham Day. David Stewart um, attempted a lesson in Roman history, um, which was interesting, but he also highlighted abuses and reminded us of the reason why we're here. Um, Graham Day, I think, very helpfully referred to the views of young people, um, and it's easy to forget about the extensive uh, uh, survey work that was taken there and how important in the early stages that was to this bill, that understanding. Can I say to Mark Ruskell, though, Mark Ruskell, really, there is no list. The committee, surely, and the member himself, must be aware how difficult compiling a list would be having attempted the exercise themselves. So not only is there not a list, but I noticed that um, a circus, Peter Jolly's circus, included a list of wild animals that it was using, um, one of which was something called a zebu. Now, I have no idea what a zebu is. I guess it's a hybrid between a zebra and something else, but it is precisely that example which probably would have been left off any attempted list on wild animals that shows why there isn't a, a list. I am, I am now, I am now uh, at, the out, at the limit of the uh, time that I have. So, uh, presiding officer, could I ask that members support the motion and approve the wild animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland bill? Thank you very much, Minister. And that concludes our stage three debate on the wild animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of three business motions. Motion 9686, setting out a business programme, and motions 9684 and 9685 on timetables for two bills. If anyone wishes to speak against any of these motions, please say so now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the motions. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No one has asked to speak against the motions. The question is that motions 9686, 9684 and 9685 be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the bureau to move motion 9682 in approval of an SSI and motion 9683 on designation of a lead committee. Moved together. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of 
Parliamentary Bureau Motion 9681 on approval of the Criminal Legal Assistance Miscellaneous Amendments Scotland Regulations 2017. Could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion? Formally moved. And I would ask any member who wishes to speak against this motion to press their request to speak button now. Thank you. And I call on Liam Kerr. Thank you, <clears throat> Presiding Officer. I rise to speak against the Cream Criminal Legal Assistance Miscellaneous Amendments Scotland Regulations 2017. Parliament is being asked to vote on this with undue and unnecessary haste, given that there is time before Part 1 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016, which contains provisions relating to the police station duty scheme, comes into force on the 25th of January 2018. In seeking to consider this SSI, the Justice Committee received a number of written submissions from the legal profession. They contained grave concerns around the proposed changes made by this SSI. It was suggested at the time that a reasonable course of action would be to allow these organisations to put their points to the committee in a formal evidence session, but the Minister refused to withdraw the SSI to allow that to happen. The concerns include, but are not limited to, the Dunfermline District Society of Solicitors, who stated there will be an increased demand in terms of police station attendance under a fee structure not fit for purpose. There will be significant issues in terms of sex and equality discrimination against solicitors, leading to greater recruitment of those who do not have children, are unlikely to so have, and do not have caring responsibilities, and that a change of employment contracts will be required. They concluded, and I quote, if the regulations are laid in the present form, then no firm will participate in the police duty scheme. The Edinburgh Bar Association stated this will increase the number of people eligible for legal advice by 163,360. And due to the downsizing of many legal firms, quote, it is unknown whether they will actually have the capacity to provide the level of service required. The association expressed concerns about the potential impact the operation of this regulation will have on their workload at a time when rates of pay are at an historic low. And they conclude, quote, the Edinburgh Bar Association is wholly unable to recommend to its members that they participate in the provision of police station advice. And finally, the Society of Solicitors in the Supreme Courts expressed concerns that the unsociable hours may offend the Article 8 right to private and family life, particularly where solicitors have childcare responsibilities or responsibilities to family members that are elderly or disabled. And now, it has recently been reported that solicitors have confirmed they are withdrawing from the police station duty scheme. Colleagues, there is parliamentary time to take further evidence on this SSI at the beginning of January. There is no need to rush into something about which such significant doubts have been expressed. And I therefore call on the Minister, even at this late stage, to withdraw the SSI to ensure these concerns are given a fair he hearing. Failing which, I ask Parliament to think very carefully before voting tonight. And if it agrees that the sensible course of action is a short delay to January when there is parliamentary time to resolve this, Parliament should vote against approving the Criminal Legal Assistance Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulations 2017 at decision time tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would call on Annabel Ewing to respond for the Government. Uh, thank you, Mr. Presiding Officer. I would draw members' attention to my entry in the Register of Interest, where they will find that I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland, hold a current practicing certificate, albeit I'm not currently practicing. These regulations on criminal legal aid are the last in a series of regulations implementing Part 1 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016. Uh, they provide a significant improvement on the current uh, fee uh, levels, including an increase to the block fee, an enhanced antisocial hours premium, an extension of the antisocial hours premium to travel time, a flat fee pro for providing telephone advice no matter how short, and uh, importantly, an easy process for claiming fees. The current arrangements for providing advice to those held in police custody is delivered by a combination of solicitors employed by the Scottish Legal Aid Board and private practitioners. It is entirely voluntary for private practitioners who can therefore choose to participate or not. Even when a firm is on duty, which can average around one week every six to 18 months, they are not obliged to attend. Therefore, the system is flexible to the needs and availability of solicitors at any given time. 
and employed solicitors provide cover for the smooth running of the scheme. This flexibility will extend to the new arrangements. The rights to legal advice in a police station are twofold. The right to a consultation, which can be via telephone, and the right for a solicitor to be present at interview. Therefore, not all legal advice is provided in person in a police station. Also, it is to be noted that as far as travel time is concerned, which of course is of particular relevance to those operating in rural areas, the antisocial hours premium can be added and uh, additional payment is possible for travel time for journeys over two hours. The Scottish Government and uh, Legal Aid Board officials have sought to provide reassurance on the requirements <coughs> of the new duty scheme and the improved fee package and flexibilities. And there were, presiding officer, very few responses to the consultation on the regulations. Notwithstanding, some solicitors have elected to withdraw from the duty scheme as they feel they cannot meet the potential additional demands that come with the increased rights of citizens held in police custody. That is the right of these solicitors. However, it is important to stress that the rights of those held in police stations will be upheld both in the short term and when the new scheme is implemented through the continued combination of private and employed solicitors. Indeed, the provision of police station advice is under constant scrutiny and review by the Scottish Legal Aid Board, which works closely with Police Scotland to ensure that sufficient cover is available across Scotland. That scrutiny will continue up to and beyond the implementations of the new arrangements from 25th January 2018. In summary, presiding officer, these regulations provide an improved financial package for those solicitors who provide police station advice. They make provision for legal aid in consequence of legislative changes already approved by this Parliament. If these regulations are not agreed, we will have to rely on the current legal aid framework, which is less attractive to solicitors, both in terms of level of fees and in terms of submitting a claim. I urge members to support these regulations. Thank you. Yes, point of order, Mr. Kerr. It's just important to declare that I am a solicitor uh, and hold a practicing certificate with the Law Society of Scotland and the Law Society of England and Wales, and I apologise to Parliament for not having done so at the start. Thank you, Mr Kerr. Thank you. The question on this SSI will uh, be put at uh, decision time, to which we now come. And there are four questions uh, this evening. The first question is that motion 9648 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on the wild animals in travelling circuses Scotland bill at stage three be agreed. And because this is a stage three, we will have a division, so members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 9648 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham is yes, 112, no, zero, abstain, zero. The motion is therefore agreed and the Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> the next question is that motion 9682 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The next question is that motion 9683 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on designation of a lead committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. <clears throat> and the final question is that motion 9681 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of the Criminal Legal Assistance Miscellaneous Regulation, so Miscellaneous Amendments Scotland Regulations 2017 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion 9681 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes 86, no, <coughs> no 25. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move on to members' business in the name of Emma Harper. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.